silent night, holy night. I love this time of year. It's the time when the days and the light grows short and the night and the dark grows long. We look at the trees outside and for all practical purposes, they look dead. But what's happened? Their sap, their life energy has gone down into Mother Earth for rest and renewal, refreshing. And that's what can happen with us. We're part of nature, too. So we're drawn inside during this time of year into that sweet darkness, that sweet silence. And guess what else? Sometimes their fears come up there to be addressed. Uh, some of you heard me talk several weeks ago about prosperity and abundance. And last week, I got hit by a whopping unexpected big expense. And fear came up, and it gave me a chance to say, Pat, did, did you really mean what you said? And to go down deep and to find and deepen my faith. I said, yeah, 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 I did. Yep. So we're also holding, we're approaching that time of the solstice, which is the darkest night of the year, more night than day. And the solstice was celebrated among other traditions, the old pagan traditions. And... Um, and I love this, this. I've told this story before, but it's worth telling again. The pagan story is that on the night of the solstice, the earth has finished a rotation around her lover, the sun. And she's at the farthest place on this oval rotation um, process, process around the sun. And not only that, she's tipped the furthest back. So she's cold, and she's more in the dark, and she's tired. <laughs> Ever feel that way? <laughs> what? <laughs> Do it again? <sighs> and she digs down deep, and she thinks of what it's going to be like in the summertime when her lover, the sun, is kissing her, and she's all warm. She goes, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that again. That's what happens on the solstice. So, interestingly enough, the journey towards spring begins on the darkest night of the year, like it does inside us. So, um, the pagans would bring in, they started the tradition of bringing in the evergreens and bringing in candles to remind us when it looks like the trees are dead and they don't know all the science that we did, you know, to hold the hope and the faith that the trees would get green again. They brought in the only green things that were still out there. And they brought in the candles to remind us that there'd be more sunlight eventually. So, and now we have the Christmas story. This is the month of the Christmas story. Unity sees the Bible in three ways. One, an ongoing story, an ancient culture. Two, it's the story of the evolution of humankind's relationship with the divine. And three, we see the Bible metaphysically. If you're new or visiting unity, what metaphysical means is it comes from the fields of philosophy and religion and it, it starts with the word physics, which has to do with science and the natural world. Those things that we can see and feel and touch. But, and then we add metaphysics. And that has to do with several things. It has to do for our, what do we ultimately believe in as our source? So in unity, we believe our source is a God that's all good. And it also has to do with those things that we can't see or touch or feel outside, but that we feel inside spiritually. It has to do with our spiritual experience, 
our spiritual evolution, our soul, that Victoria talked about in our meditation, and those, and wisdom, how wisdom comes to us through intuition and nudges from God. So I, I think, um, I think we're at whatever that God is. You can call it the universe, spirit, whatever, nature, divine being. And far as I know, unity is the only uh, Christian-based, and we're so different than, than the traditional Christian basis, but as far as I know, we're the only ones who do biblical, metaphysical translations. So when we interpret things in unity, when we interpret things metaphysically, every character, every place in the Bible has a metaphysical meaning. Co-founder of Unity, Charles Fillmore, who I resisted reading until I got into seminary and had to because he was so dense, because he was so smart. Myrtle, his wife, she was right from the heart. I always chose Myrtle, but then I had to start reading her for some of my courses. He wrote this big book, this big, heavy book that's as big as the biggest dictionary you've seen called the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. Now, how did he... He didn't just make up stuff. He, he exercised great care in writing this. First of all, he consulted many authorities and he consulted many dictionaries in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic to see what the root meanings of the words were. He traced them to the original roots. For example, the word we use for hell, the original Hebrew word for that was where they burned the garbage outside the city of Jerusalem. That's where the word hell came from. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Charles also said, look, I, I'm, I'm not the be all and end all. I encourage everybody to, with prayer and reflection, interpret the Bible metaphysically as you're moved to do. So that's what we're going to explore in the Christmas story today. The Christmas story is archetypal. Archetypal means stories and myths from many of the traditions that has to do with our psycho-spiritual evolution. Uh, like the story of Odysseus and his famous voyage to and from Troy and Inanna going to the underground and coming back up. All, lots of the old myths and traditions are archetypal. For example, the virgin birth, that's nothing new. That didn't just happen in the Christian story. Uh, Romulus and Remus, who started Rome, they were mythically uh, born of a virgin. So was Ra, the Egyptian sun god, and Dionysius, that Greek god of uh, great mischief. And also in Hinduism and Buddhism, the difference is that, it, that Jesus was an actual person on earth, actually born of a virgin. So metaphysically, what is a, a, a virgin? What does that mean? It is our soul. It is that pure, innocent, divine-serving part of us that believes in messengers and angels from God. And we all have that part of us inside. So, our story begins with the Virgin Mary. And Gabriel comes to her and says, Hey, Mary, don't be afraid, but you're going to have a baby. And she says, Well, how, how, can, this, and how can this be so? And, and, and Gabriel says, Well, it's God's going to impregnate you, and this baby is going to be the son of God. And he will become a savior for humankind. And her soul says, her soul, after a while, after she gets over the what, her soul says, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. She said, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. What that really means is we are so honored to serve when God calls us to do what we're called to do. So how does this take place in us? So we get this nudge or this message from God, and we might, we might first say, what? You, you want me to do what? 
And what does God, what does Gabriel's message require? What did it require of Mary? And what does it require of all of us? We have to pull up one of our 12 powers, and the one she had to pull up was imagination. She could see uh, the potential. She could see the potential. She could feel it of what God was telling her. So in us, God may keep nudging us inside. That's how, that's how the messages come to me, nudges. Um, and Gabriel symbolizes our power of wisdom, and sometimes we feel that through intuition. Uh, and it, it persists. Um, 20-some years ago, I was living alone on a sailboat, and I was recovering from that my husband and my mom and my dad had died within a year and a half of one another. And God kept nudging me. You know, you've been thinking about getting a dog for a long time. It's time now. It was November. I was, I was living on a boat, and it was cold and icy. And I was less reverent than I am now. I mean, I was more irreverent, less reverent. <laughs> And I said, are you crazy? It's wintertime. I'm settling two estates. Are you crazy? But God wouldn't let me alone. Nudge, nudge. And I said, okay, just so you'll shut up. I'm going up to the I'm going up to the shelter, but it has to be a black lab, and there probably will not be any black labs up there. Well, the name of my boat was Warrior Woman. I named it that after my husband died because he used to call me his warrior woman because I studied karate and he studied yoga. <laughs> so he, he, yeah, anyway, he was a ferocious trial lawyer who loved to study yoga, yoga and I was a th psychotherapist taking karate. So my boat was named Warrior Woman and I went up there and guess what? There was a black lab puppy named Warrior. I mean, the story's longer. I resisted a bunch more till finally I got hit over the head, but that's the short version. So that's the way it is when we get those intuitive nudges that just won't let us go. What's the difference between intuition and impulse? It's the pre 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 perseverance. The, the, the intuition, God's message, kind of won't let us go. You've heard that phrase, the hound of heaven? keeps after us. Whereas an impulse is like a firecracker, a short fuse, and it doesn't stay around. That's the difference between an impulse and intuition. So Mary becomes impregnated, like this new thing we are to, to do begins to grow in us. Her soul becomes impregnated with new potential for us. Now, Joseph eventually realizes that Mary's pregnant. And he's betrothed to her. And in those days, it's not like breaking off an, an engagement with your fiancé. Betrothed was betrothed. And he, he was a good guy. He didn't want to bring shame on her. So he plans to secretly divorce her. But Gabriel comes to him in a dream and explains what is happening. And Joseph contemplates God's message, and he has this big struggle. And he finally surrenders. Who's the Joseph of us? That's the conventional part of us. What will people say? What will people think? My wife is to be as pregnant, and we're not married yet. You know, it's, it's that conventional part of us. The part of us... Uh, that like Joseph, when this change comes along, when God's nudging us and we have this new change, we have to go through a real struggle in our consciousness to change it. We have to stop resisting God, kind of like I surrender, like we sing before our meditation. We have to stop resisting. And then what 12 power, what of our 12 powers will we use? Our power of will. Okay, after the struggle, we go, okay. We will do this thing. And, and God created us with free will, so we can choose to go along with God's nudges or not, just because we're made in the image of God. And so Joseph chooses to go along, and we can too. And like with Joseph, 
Will stimulates other powers, stimulates powers of faith and wisdom and strength and imagination. Those are the, let's do this, let's get this done powers. So that's what happens with Joseph. Now, Caesar has ordered a census, which means that Mary and Joseph have to take that famous trip to Bethlehem. And they have this big spiritual thing going on. She's about to give birth to the Savior of mankind, and they have to get on a donkey and make this trip to Bethlehem. Metaphysically, what this tells us is that our spiritual transformation can happen while we're doing that which life demands of us. Paying our taxes, washing the dishes, raking the yard, whatever it is that life demands of us, the spiritual transformation is still happening inside. So Jesus is pretty quickly born in the stable. Gabriel's been a busy guy. He's now appearing to the shepherds who are watching their flocks in the fields by night. And they, um, they, Gabriel tells the shepherds, be not afraid. There's a Savior born, and you can find him in a stable. Go see him. So they do, and they are just overcome with love and joy, and they go back and watch these precious sheep. Uh, with even greater love and joy, because love begets love. The sheep are symbol. The shepherds, I'm sorry, are symbolic of those common human parts of us, because the divine in us is there to love all the different parts of us: the humble parts, the less evolved parts, all the parts of us. So. Then we have the wise men who come a couple of months later. And the wise men, metaphysically, are all the wisdom that we have accumulated during our many incarnations. So those wise men in us, they've been around the block a few lifetimes. And they persevere in our quest for spiritual consciousness. Uh, and they have the faith to do these seemingly crazy, weird things. They're not like Joseph. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to follow a star. What's, what's so crazy about that? We, we know that's what we're supposed to do. We'll, we'll follow a star. That'll lead us to the Christ. So they do. And Herod hears that the king of the Jews has been born. And he feels really threatened. His plan is to find this baby and kill it. Who is Herod of us? Herod is the egocentric ego. Is that redundant? No. Because <laughs> our ego gets a bad rap. We all need ego to navigate this human life. And like in the chakra system, like if everything goes as it should, our ego part, our will, our walking the earth as ourselves is right here in this solar plexus chakra, and it's underneath the heart chakra where the divine dwells in us. So the ego can be there to serve the divine, or it can be really threatened and think it's got to do it all by itself and kill off any new potential that's born in us because it wants to be in charge all by itself. Um, so what is the new potential that might be being born in you right now that the ego might feel threatened about? So, let's go now to Christ, the center of the story. What does the birth of Christ in each of us symbolize? First of all, it's our new potential. It's the birth of new potential inside us for our life. Secondly, Christ the Savior. What does that mean inside and outside? In traditional Christianity, Savior, and some of us have taken a trip through those places, <laughs> Savior it means that we, were, we, were all, we are all sinners, 
and that Jesus came down and was crucified on the cross to save us then and forever from our sins because we are just sinful people. We don't believe that in unity. Um, I learned something really interesting in my Fillmore course. I had it in my theology course that I'm taking this term. And um, Charles Fillmore says that Adam and Eve, like that story, that unfolding happened in the ethers. It didn't happen in a place on earth because God was still working in the perfect idea of perfect man and woman. So it happened out in the ethers with a higher vibration. And that the fall, and, and again, because Adam and Eve were created in God's image and had free will like God does, they, of their own free will, decided to separate from this wonderful, amazing connection with the divine that they had. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the fall was not only out of the garden, but it was a fall into material reality, into denser human bodies. So part, and we still have this yearning for that Eden state where we're more connected. And we've made a lot of wrong turns in search of that yearning. Young and analyst Marion Woodman says that addictions are all part of our search for the divine. Drugs, alcohol, TV, sex, gambling, work, um, all of these things are misplaced searches for the divine. So we all had that yearning and humankind had taken some, a lot of wrong turns. So the divine sent down part of itself into a human body that also had that connection with the divine that we all had in that Eden state. And he's, he, um, he, Fillmore uses this analogy of a spider web. Like there's this big spider web and humankind is caught in this spider web and there's this Edenic Eden state. And Jesus came down, and he was in the spider web, and he said, look, I found the hole. I'll show you the way out. Follow me. Come on. So he is our way shower, showing us how we can have that deeper connection with the divine and live from that place. And the third thing is, get ready for this. Savior means, in this season, the birth of the awareness of the Messiah that we are. Jewish rabbi Robert Levine said, there is no Messiah. Can you imagine a Jewish rabbi? They've been, they're still waiting for a Messiah. And he said, there's no, he wrote a book. There's no, there's no Messiah and you're it. What about that? So Jesus came to show us the way. And he said, I just came to show you the way. All these things that I have done, you can do, and even better. I'm just your brother who came down to do this, show you how to do it. And the apostles did all those things. If they can, we can too. And that, that we are the Messiah, that we can practice at whatever level we are. That wonderful Jewish word that I love, the tikkun, tikkun olam the repairing of the world, person by person, situation by situation, by however we are individually gifted by the divine. It may be as a healer of body, mind, soul, maybe as a teacher of little children, maybe a speaker, maybe just being a good example, maybe the kind of things that we do for each other in community, coming to Michael's service for Annie or delivering food or the little bits of service that we do. We are the Messiah. And the last thing is that Jesus' birth is also a gift from God for an abundant life. Jesus said, I came that ye may live life more abundantly, more full of joy, more full of all the ways that we experience abundance. 
So we celebrate the inner birth of the new potential, the conscious awareness of the Messiah of us, and the gift of living life more abundantly. May we celebrate all of these things in this season. Silent night, holy, holy night.